this panel will try to refocus a little bit on uh, the reason why we're here, actually, because uh, we're talking about the investor-facing sustainability standards put forward by the ISSB. And of course, the idea behind that is that some sort of market discipline will induce a transition to more sustainable uh, economic activity. And therefore, of course, the investors as the demand side uh, are key in this, in this whole game. And we want to shed light a little bit on uh, whether this vision is actually uh, having some traction in the real world and in, the, uh, in, the th in theory and in the empirical evidence that we have. And I'm delighted to have uh, this fantastic panel of uh, truly globally leading scholars and also uh, Maximilian Horster, who's going to ground the vile visions of the academics with some real world experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I'm not going to go through the impressive CVs of all my panelists. I'm just uh, quickly introducing them in order to uh, make you understand why I think uh, it's extremely valuable to have them here for the discussion about uh, standard setting in sustainability. Uh, in the sustainability space. Uh, first, we have in the uh, uh, alphabetic order, we have Almut Arnett, who joins us from K KIT, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and she's a scientist, and she has a wide experience in particularly modeling, of course, um, and therefore, I think it is um, extremely helpful. And there we have Jeff Gordon, um, who's drinking. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Coffee. Uh, Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, let me just return to Almud a little bit. Um, so um, Almud has this extensive experience in uh, truly modeling the things that we have been uh, discussing and therefore, of course, can provide valuable input, as I think, uh, with regard to uh, what investors should care about in their, uh, regarding their preferences and how, how the world actually relates to them. Uh, our second panelist is Jeff Gordon who joins us uh, from Columbia Law School and got up really early in New York, so thanks for that as well. And Jeff is uh, just uh, a seminal scholar who's written on financial regulation and corporate governance and has a specific interest in how investors actually behave and what, what drives their behavior. And therefore, it's, of course, extremely valuable uh, in shedding light on the questions that we discuss. And then we also have uh, Lucrezia Reichlin, who is an economist, and a, particularly a macroeconomist, and who has been pioneering uh, in methodological questions, once again also bringing new uh, methodologies to, to essentially understanding how uh, the economy works and how uh, equilibria actually turn out to come. And that is something that is very helpful for our debate as well, because that, of course, can shed light on how we can induce investors to play a role in this and what actually we can expect from that. And then, uh, last but certainly not least, we have Maximilian Horster, who is currently head of ISS ESG, so uh, he's working for uh, uh, the Institutional Shareholder Services, and, and therefore, as a proxy advisor, is uh, really uh, advising uh, or is sort of at the interface between firms and investors, and therefore has, of course, a clear real world understanding of what investors are interested in and how they react to the challenges that we are facing. And without further ado, um, I would just leave the alphabetical order and first turn over to Jeff to give us his initial remarks uh, from sort of a micro perspective. Uh, and then I would turn over to Lucrezia, who can uh, shed some light on the macro aspects and then give it the floor to Almut and then or, uh, then then uh, <clears throat> Maximilian is just going to trash everything and say how these things <laughs> really work. So, Jeff, over to you. Take it away. All right. Then, basically, um, I'll stop sh trying. Uh, the title of my talk is um, Systematic Stewardship, Yes. Climate Change Disclosure, Yes. Sustainability Disclosure, No. And the uh, title is really um, what the talk attempts to say. Um, I come at this from the perspective of uh, systematic stewardship, which is an effort to provide a foundation for a form of pro-social engagement by large investors and asset managers with their portfolio firms and with the broader governance environment that fits both their theory of investing and their low-cost business model. And the claim is that systematic stewardship 
provides a finance theory approach for such investors to address some of the most serious issues, climate change risk, financial stability risk uh, being among them. Uh, the core idea of systematic stewardship is really of modern portfolio theory, that investors want to ma maximize risk-adjusted returns, not expected returns. And while portfolio diversification permits the elimination of idiosyncratic risk, not systematic risk. Um, and so uh, that means from a stewardship perspective, looking at firm specific interventions are li likely to have a high return because those interventions are gonna be with respect to idiosyncratic features of firms. On the other hand, a plausible goal for a diversified investor like an index fund is to attempt to reduce systematic risk. So the critical point that I wanna make is that this is not a trade-off model. It's not accepting lower risk-adjusted returns in exchange for uh, mitigation of climate change risk. Rather, it accepts the idea that the climate change risk presents systematic risk, and that if we can reduce that risk, we will improve risk-adjusted returns. Um, and so therefore, for an investor like an index fund, uh, trying to reduce systematic risk is not driven by socially responsible investing, uh, but really finance theory in the hunt for best risk-adjusted returns. So the climate change disclosure is an obvious uh, winner in this analysis uh, because climate change is um, a systematic risk. I don't think I have to explain to this audience why that is. Um, the multiple channels for economic harm uh, would reduce values across an entire portfolio the not just the transition risk, but the non-linearity of the risks involved uh, make it a systematic risk. It's really existential. But the point I wanna make with disclosure, it's manageable. There's really a single variable to focus on, greenhouse gas emissions, specifically carbon. And there's agreement on the importance of that one disclosurable item, the variable, carbon or greenhouse gas emissions in a broader sense. Moreover, I think disclosure can actually improve the outcomes here. That is to say, with disclosure, I think the markets can better price systematic risk. And so there will be a mul multiplier effect of disclosure across the portfolio. Um, a further point, it focuses attentions on a single thing. Uh, with one can monitor the degree of greenhouse ga gas emissions, the carbon emissions. Um, it's like the case for share shareholder value. A single variable, a single variable, uh, you can monitor and see if uh, the progress is up or down. Um, so, you know, that's the reason why a disclosure of the green of, of climate change risk is relevant and it will improve uh, the outcomes. Sustainability, on the other hand, um, disclosure is many, many things. There's no single variable of interest. It's impossible to measure. It runs all of the issues that have plagued ESG uh, disclosure um, and indeed um, mean that ESG generally has become a marketing device more, more than any other uh, effective way to control how firms behave. Um, the intellectual foundations of it are kind of remarkable to me. This is one advantage of really flying across the Atlantic to talk to, talk to folks. Um, you know, the perspectives in the EU and the, the U.S. are quite different in this regard. Reading the sustainability uh, disclosure draft one, the fundamental 
premise that investors on a secondary mar market are, quote, providing resources, end quote, to, to the firm is, is just false. Um, how do firms finance themselves? The ongoing firms, retained earnings, debt issuance, the main question of which is, am I repaid? within the relatively short time frame of the, the bank loan. Um, it's rarely selling shares. So, so what's, the, what's the connection to the sustainability claim and, and the fact that investors are providing re, 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 resources to these firms? Um, another concern is I think for any significant business, uh, disclosure, other than the carbon disclosure, sustainability disclosure, will either produce encyclopedias as annual reports or wor works of fiction, and perhaps both. For most biz businesses, sustainability is competitive survival, Mar markets, demand, innovation. This is especially true for SMEs. And I think, frankly, any strategy uh, that increases the role of banks and the argument that I heard on the prior panel was that's good because they can monitor sustainability better, especially for SMEs. Well, I think slow, slow, slow down growth um, and will produce rationing of credit for state validated ends. It'll become social policy in the allocation of credit. So as I say, um, uh, I, I think climate change disclosure is extremely important. And in the United States, we're now going through an exercise with the attempt to do that, to overcome the sort of the political barriers to that. But sustainability disclosure, as I see it, at least in the, uh, the draft that was um, uh, uh, presented, um, um, I, 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 I think is... Um, it confuses the, the climate change issue is existential. Let's focus on that. Try to move things forward on that. And I think pursuing the, the multiple different goals within the sustainability agenda uh, will prove extremely frustrating in the end. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. Very concise, very clear, and of course, uh, very controversial, I guess, uh, in this, uh, particularly looking at uh, Sue. Uh, but, but very interesting, and I, I just uh, think there's a lot of things to discuss. I'm not going to open this up right now, but I'm just turning it immediately over to Lucrezia and um, soliciting her views on the issues that we discuss. <coughs> How can investors contribute, and will they? Yes, thank you, um, and thank you for organizing uh, this uh, first event. Um, so you ask a very kind of mysterious question, so I'll read it, the question that you sent me. Can investors induce a green transition that achieves climate targets? How does the resulting equilibrium look like? Okay, so the first one, the first part is relatively clear, the second maybe not, but uh, let me just say something to introduce that, uh, referring to the discussion we had earlier on this morning, Investors uh, are only a part of the story, they're not the whole story. It is obvious, and this I'm referring especially to the discussion that we had in the previous panel just before us. Uh, it is obvious that uh, to, you know, to fight climate change, uh, we need uh, multiple tools, multiple instruments, we need public policy, we need civil society, we need regulators, we need all kinds of stuff. But uh, investors have to be part of that because of many reasons. First of all, because investors, uh, you know, put capital uh, in, uh, in the economy. But also because we need, we need private capital because, as we know, the carbon tax and these instruments, uh, they really face uh, a lot of headwind in the implementation. And, uh, and, you know, we are, and, and therefore, we need to have complementary tools. So that's my first, uh, uh, my first observation. Now, uh, when we come to investors, there are several questions that we can ask, okay? One is, uh, does it really make any difference? I mean, what do we know so far about uh, this uh, committed capital to climate and to broader sustainability issues, uh, has it really made a difference? Okay, so that's the first question. So the second question is why should the investor 
care and do they care? So what do the data tell us? Uh, what are the channels through which uh, you know, their investments uh, actually make a difference? And then, of course, coming uh, you know, to the ISSB, uh, you know, what is the different roles that regulators, standard setters, uh, and uh, security regulators and so on and, and, and public policy makers can have because you know each of these uh, different agents uh, have a different role to play and there is often uh, quite a lot of confusion about who should do what okay so on the first question the effect on the environment uh, the evidence is not that clear i mean we know that uh, there is some correlation that uh, sustainable investment the so-called sustainable investment has grew, for example, in the, U in the U.S. from 2014 to 2018, from 18 to 26% of the total asset under management. And we know that over the same period, the average carbon intensity of the listed companies has gone down, but this is just a correlation. And, uh, you know, that may, may be explained by a lot of, uh, uh, you know, other factors. On the other hand, uh, the academic empirical literature shows that uh, there is some effect on pricing, on asset prices. Uh, and this, I think, it's, uh, it's an interesting channel to try to understand what's actually going on in the market. Uh, so, of course, more research needs to be done on here. Now, on the second question, why, and I will return to the evidence uh, on asset prices. On the second question, why should investors go green? Uh, and what do the data say? Uh, there are basically two main explanations. One is that uh, preference or even utility, so they get some utility from holding green. Uh, so this is uh, actually is very much uh, economics uh, jargon because in terms of interpretation, you can interpret this as uh, either preference shift shifting, investors want to do good, or that policy is shifting and therefore, in anticipation of these policies, investors adjust to that. But the second uh, is actually that investors care about risk, okay, both physical and transition risk, and this is what uh, Jeffrey emphasized. Now, both mechanisms should affect expected returns negatively, and so lower the cost of capital, so that's one, uh, you know, one channel. And, uh, you know, the academic literature typically put all these motivation together because it's very difficult in the data to, you know, to try to disentangle what drives what, whether it is preferences or it is actually risk. Uh, it is quite a fascinating question uh, to me because, uh, you know, shifting preferences uh, it sounds uh, very mysterious and exogenous uh, for, uh, you know, finance theory, but, uh, you know, it is uh, definitely something that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, researchers should care about in understanding. Now, um, so um, both preferences uh, and, uh, um, and regulations uh, should lower expected returns in, in green companies. Uh, or, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, they, they could reflect this, uh, these two things. Now, from the uh, ISSB standard setting perspective, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I mean, I I'm talking about we because I'm a trustee of the FRS, amongst other things, and so I was involved in the setting of the SSB. Uh, we have decided to focus on, on purpose on only what is financially material, so on the risk and opportunities which are financially material for the companies. And uh, this we have done it on purpose, uh, first of all, because we are a global organization and uh, we are not a public policy organization. So we understand that public policy and aspiration may be different across the globe. But from the market perspective, since the capital market is global, we need to have a global understanding of this risk uh, and the materiality of this risk. So this is our perspective, which is limited, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it is important to construct this b first building block, this kind of global core that Sue was talking about, uh, that uh, will, uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, aggregate the market understanding around these things. Now, uh, of course, because preferences are shifting and because, or maybe the <coughs> perception of risk is shifting, also in relationship to policy, and this is one of the points that we discussed this morning, uh, this uh, materiality is dynamic, okay? That's the concept of dynamic materiality that was discussed uh, earlier on this morning. And this is, uh, it sounds very vague, but it's actually very important to understand how the materiality 
evolves in relation to the changing landscape, the changing understanding uh, of how risk uh, impact uh, on companies, okay? So uh, we, for that, I mean, uh, we reply, uh, so the, the, the kind of the architecture of the SSE document reflects the con this concept of dynamic materiality. Now, on the third the issues is which are the channels uh, um, how do uh, green invest, uh, investment uh, can have a comp uh, an impact on companies? Well, portfolio screening is, is, one, uh, is one channel. Shareholder engagement uh, is, is the other channel. Uh, now, by underweighting uh, or excluding most carbon intensive companies from, from their investment uh, uh, portfolio, then the green investors uh, increase, you know, they affect the cost of capital. So th this is uh, one, uh, one channel. And uh, engaging, uh, so the shareholder engagement uh, also may help uh, in uh, not totally decarbonizing portfolios, but tilting in relationship uh, to disclosure on how companies, uh, uh, you know, under, you know, kind of disclose mm -hmm. on uh, on their uh, you know adjustment of the business model of the strategy, you know, to face this risk. Okay, so we don't want to kind of uh, that the world to decarbonize tomorrow because that will create stranded asset, will create other risk. Okay, but uh, it is important that this engagement uh, with investors uh, is part of the philosophy of uh, the ISSB document. I think it's important. Now coming to the evidence, uh, so what do we know as far as I understand? because uh, you know my uh, I have uh, limited experience uh, in this field but you know I'm getting into it uh, uh, you know from the policy side I understand that, uh, uh, that, it, that there is some ev evidence uh, that expected returns in green companies are lower than in brown companies. Uh, there is a paper by Bolton and uh, Capitz, Capitz, you know, it's very difficult for Watch me to... Watch, it's going to be here. Uh, yeah, I know. So, the, you so. know, BK, okay, let's call it BK, which is a very uh, interesting paper because, uh, uh, you know, it exploits information, very detailed information at the company level. And, uh, you know, they look at the emissions uh, as proxy for transition risk uh, and find positive correlation between emissions and returns. Okay, so this is a very crude way to go about this problem, but you know, it's the first comprehensive paper that uh, shows that uh, actually, uh, you know, there is, there is a premium there. Uh, not, uh, the, you know, the evidence is not totally consensual because this is a very difficult empirical problem. For example, another uh, important uh, uh, result, which is important for our discussion on the SSB, uncertainty matters. So we know that uh, with uncertainty about disclosure, uncertainty about risk, uncertainty about data, uh, then uh, uh, you know the, uh, the the gap, the spectral return gap between brown and green asset narrow. Why is this the case? Because investors, green investors, uh, diversify their exposure to <coughs> mitigate the risk. So, uh, for example, you know there are papers that find that uh, uncertainty affects the equity premiums uh, and also the demand for risky asset. Uh, also, Bolton and KB, B and K also find that disclosure, for example, matters so because it lowers the risk premium. So overall, I, I read that the evidence uh, it is actually is telling us uh, it matters for premium, but uncertainty is a concern, so disclosure will help. Disclosure and data. And so um, here I just want to uh, make a remark that uh, disclosure is the first step. Okay, and so far we don't have uh, common standards all over the world. That should be an aspiration, you know, but these standards, the second step is to implement the standards, to make them mandatory, to make them assurable and auditable. Without that step, uh, this is not gonna bite, okay? And this is why the standard setters are doing a good job, but we also need the security regulators and uh, you know the public policy to make sure that the standards are going to be made mandatory the ssb does not have that uh, power okay this you know, they make suggestions recommendations and so this i think is going to be you know the next it has to be you know the next uh, you know focus uh, in this debate uh, so we need we need to look at that and the data issues uh, uh, you know is very complex uh, 
to have standards does not necessarily mean that we have good data. And uh, so I think that uh, you know, if, if this uh, group will continue to work, this should be an area of, uh, uh, of concern. The third thing is uh, dynamics. Uh, so as I said before, uh, you know, this, the preferences and regulation change. So uh, realized returns uh, are, are taken as proxy for expected returns, uh, but realized returns may increase as a result of an expected increase in preferences for green, so that will increase market evaluation. So, and this is this is actually points. So, uh, this is this point has been made in the literature. It, it's just it means that to do empirical lit, uh, research in this area is difficult uh, because uh, you know we are in a situation in which there are you know sh unexpected shift that uh, change uh, you know the market valuation as a whole. So this is you know what would be you, you know i think there is a very fascinating agenda for empirical research and uh, you have great people here in frankfurt so i hope that there will be a lot of phd's on that let me finish on the fourth point uh, what is the different role of regulators standard setters and policy makers in this area as i said i think there is a role for all um now um the, um, on, the, on the standard setting, uh, uh, you know, we don't have a benevolent dictator in the world. Uh, we have quite rightly so different aspiration on how tough you want to have on, to be on climate standards with the Europe uh, possibly, you know, ahead on, uh, on the ambition, on the level of ambition. But, uh, you know, since the market is global, I think we need to have, uh, you know, Oh, an aspiration uh, to have uh, an interoperability between uh, a global standards which is accepted by all jurisdictions and all these other requirements. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important point that Sue made this morning in her presentation, the building block approach, which means that uh, although countries uh, will maybe have different requirements, uh, you know, for the point of view of a preparer, it will be clear what is the global standards that they will have to comply with and what are the top up, which inevitably will be driven by a policy making process uh, and, you know, public policy and the ISSB, the FRS is not not a, a, a public policy institution, okay? And then, of course, uh, the other important role uh, is uh, actually of the IOSCO, the security regulators, to make sure that the assurance and the auditors and so on, so that, that the, part, uh, the assurance uh, will, uh, uh, will be there, okay? Because otherwise, the standards uh, will become non-credible. So with that, I will finish. All right. Thanks. <coughs> uh, thanks, Akritza. So I think you touched upon many things. Some of those will be discussed uh, on later panels. But I think one of the uh, key messages that both Jeff and you are sending is that investors care, but only so much, uh, and meaning insofar as they are affected. And then uh, Marcin Kaczmarczyk has been mentioned, Pat Bolton's paper with him, they show that Jeff probably is right, uh, that they care about climate. Uh, they care about carbon emissions, the price of carbon, that's real, that's empirical evidence for that. The question is whether that's the only thing that they care about, but we can, think about this uh, during the discussion. But one thing that I think is a takeaway from, from the discussion already is that if investors care insofar as they are affected, they need to know what actually affects them. And that brings me to Almut because I think in your modeling exercises, you're trying to also shed light among many things um, on the interaction and interdependence of uh, the Earth system, broadly understood economic activity, and the feedback loops that we see there. And maybe you can just enlighten us on what we know and what we don't know. Mm. I got a few slides, and I think there was a clicker somewhere. Yes, there's one. <coughs> right, and I think I would like to actually start, um, you know, coming back to the natural systems perspective, um, to actually pick up the level of required ambition. I think it was a good keyword to sort of, you know, feed into my talk. And I would like to us to take us back a little bit to the year 1990, when the first assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change was released, <coughs> which said, amongst others, we predict a likely increase in global mean temperature of about one degree centigrade above the present value by 2025. So where are we now? 2022. This is from the sixth assessment report of the IPCC Working Group 1 that came out last year. And we have reached 1.1 1, 1 .1 degree warming, more or less spot on 
uh, as was projected, maybe even warmer than was projected already 30 years or 32 years ago. 32 years of inaction, right? That's our emissions of carbon, of CO2 only at this, uh, in this uh, example, from the year 1990. And I'm not going to go into much detail, but emissions continue to increase. You see the little kink at the end of the line? There was about a five, maybe 6% decrease of emissions due to the COVID lockdown. The global economy locked down for several months, and what we have is five to 6% decrease in emissions. It's nothing. And we're back on track. We are actually on track not to 1.5 degrees, not to 2 degrees. We are on track, as I'm not sure who mentioned it already this morning, to something like between 3 and 4 degrees warming. 32 years of inaction. And what does that mean? You know, banging the same drum as Leonid did this morning. It puts us into plenty of challenges to deal with those temperature and precipitation trends. But it's actually the extreme events, the extreme weather events that we're feeling and that are really going to cost us in terms of money and in terms of human losses and in terms of biodiversity loss. Again, from the IPCC, an extreme temperature event that occurred once in 50 years without human influence, i.e. pre-industrial, let's say in 1750, is already now, at one degree warmer world, likely to occur about five times as often. If we have two centigrades of warming, about 14 times likely. If we are actually on our three to four degree trajectory, this extreme event will be the new normal, right? We have to act and we have to act quite drastically and at an extremely high level of ambitions. I'm not going to talk about the money because you know, I'm preaching to the converted, I guess, in this particular room. So acting on climate change is urgent, but it needs a broad, I would say, holistic environmental and societal perspective. We need to keep climate change in mind, but from a really systemic perspective. First of all, you know, Katrin mentioned it already this morning, climate change is a risk to biodiversity at all levels, species, ecosystems, genes, you name it. But we do need biodiversity to mitigate and also to adapt to climate change. And I think it was on Simone's uh, slide, I mean, just to give you an example, on Simone's slide this morning, and we didn't talk about it, just to give you one example. At present, land ecosystems and oceans each year absorb nearly 50%, nearly 50% of all the carbon emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. About 30% goes into land ecosystems. Healthy forests in the boreal, in the tropics, healthy savannas, all kinds of healthy biodiverse systems are actually saving us from a massive warming that we would be already seeing by now. We would probably, without the ocean and, 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 and uh, land sinks, we probably would be by, I don't know, 600 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere rather than only 420. We would definitely be at the two degree warming already now without those massive contributions of biodiverse healthy ecosystems. We need them, right? But as a consequence, interestingly, you know, people are aware of those carbon sinks. They say, hey, presto, we can actually save global warming by planting lots of trees. Great, you know, we're out of it. Save it. Well, it's not going to save us. There's many issues associated with, you know, afforestation and reforestation <coughs> to mitigate climate change. Many of them are good. But we simply don't have the area unless we want to start eating trees and they're not very tasty as far as I know, right? We don't have the area. Pl tree planting will not help us. Offsetting carbon through planting trees will not help us. And finally also, you know, some of the, you know, business opportunities that we might see in terms of, you know, m you know mitigating and adapting to climate change will have, you know, unintended side effects. Planting trees is just one of them. There's many of those both climatic, environmental, and societal, and they occur locally as well as elsewhere. Right. So we really need to keep that in mind when we're talking about business opportunities in, in, like sort of, you know, in the climate system. So my final slide, sort of, you know, just to bring this to, to a concluding end, sort of, you know, what, what, you know, what is it about? Sort of, you know, how does it relate to disclosure of data and related to risk and opportunities? We really need to 
and realize and accept that we're talking about co a complex system. And a complex system has so-called wicked problems. We have plenty of wicked problems in these rooms. Wicked problems are problems that we cannot find an easy solution with. And this is just the challenge we are facing. We can't deal with that. We can't, we can't make those wicked problems you know, go away. We need, you know, when we have targets set as individuals, as companies, as countries, uh, we need to have you know, a holistic information that helps us to sort of measure the you know, positives and also unintended side effects uh, by reaching those targets. We can reach climate targets and mess up our planet big times if we're not very careful. So this is not easy. If it was easy, somebody would have done it before, right? But we just have to accept it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so clearly making a point that, once again, disclosure matters, but it has to be done in the right way. And particularly, I think the holistic idea uh, makes it very challenging in the sense that uh, we have to have a good understanding on how things actually you know, depend and are intertwined. Um, but I'm not sure um, how this has already filtered into the real world, and uh, therefore I'm happy that Max will enlighten us on that. Uh, and I, I should have said that Max is deeply invested in these matters because he's not only been working for ISS for a long time, but he's also been setting up a known company which uh, was dealing with these issues, and therefore um, I think he has also entrepreneurial spirits in this, and therefore, Max, uh, what's your take on the question that we're asking here? Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much. I, I feel very honored that you depict me as the real world representative. I, fo I found it very real what I heard on the panel, and, um, and uh, it was very enlightening so far. Thank you very much for this. So um, maybe to explain what it is that we are doing with ISS ESG, we are a data and service provider, so similar to Simone, whom you met, or Hannah Hemke there in the back. We basically work with investors. They come to us to better understand the environmental, social, and governance aspects of their investments. How do we do that? We have you know, a few hundred people who analyze a few thousand assets, and we have maybe one and a half thousand or so clients, investors, who are, who are using this data. And by listening to the discussion as we had it so far, I would like to propose a very simple differentiation of how data is being used on the topic of climate change in the market by investors today. Because I think that, ha that does help a little bit disentangle the discussion. So there are basically um, they're, they're two use cases, if you like, of climate data out there by different type of investors. I think that's what, you, um, what you're getting at when you, when you talk about you know, the, 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 the materiality that is, that is moving. Um, when we started 30 years ago, most of our clients were church investors and foundations. So they were investors who said, we want to make sure that our money helps or doesn't harm the climate. Right? It was all about, what does my money do to the world out there? 15 years later, 20 years later, this shifted, and it was all of a sudden the risk topic that was driving this. So the logic of, in how far does the world out there impact my risks or my returns? So that's a very different logic, right? What is my money doing to the world versus what is the world doing to my money? To give you an example, if you are investing in a solar panel producer, my favorite example, solar panel producer on the shores of Florida, and um, if and you're an impact investor, you might say, this is great, I'm investing in this company because it is part of the energy transition. It's solar panels, right? So you might invest in this company. If you're driven by risk considerations from a climate change perspective, you might say, I'm not investing in this company because, cl because climate risk, the increasing hurricanes, might hit this company in a way that it, its operation will stop next summer again for two months or so. So depending on whether it is impact that is driving you or it is risk that dri it's driving you using different data. And if you follow the regulatory debate, and I think that's what Jeff was getting at. Um, <laughs> sorry, a um, bit uh, uh, um, focusing on the wrong things here. Um, if you look at the regulatory debates, in North America, the SEC is currently talking about climate risk. So the question of how the... Um, the real world risks are impacting investments, while the regulator, uh, regulators in Europe are talking about the role that investors have to play to achieve our societal goals. Right? So the European regulator has very much this impact 
case in mind, at least in the subtext, the North American regulator more risk. And Jeff, therefore, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not surprised that you're also taking this risk angle or re re represent this here on the panel. There's another dimension to data, which is, when is this data being used? There's basically a use case where you're using data to report. So you invest the, the way you've always invested, and now you need to report on your climate impact or on your climate risk. And that reporting of data is very prescriptive. You're being told what to report on, greenhouse gas emissions, for example, or other aspects. And there's no wiggle room. You're being told as an investor what you have to report. You come to a data provider and you ask, please help me report on what I'm being asked to report. There's also the investment use case. So again, the, 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 the use case that I heard more from Jeff here, which is I'm taking this data to invest or not invest in a company. And again, it's different data that you would use there because as an investor, you don't want to use the exact same data that your competitor uses. You might want to use in the investment case data that gives you an edge, that helps you recognize patterns that others haven't um, recognized. So again, if it is if it is reporting or if it is investing, you might need different data. And I think that, just as a little bit of a framework, that hopefully helps also for, the, for this discussion because um, there is this logic a little bit that if we tell companies how to report, investors will pick that up. They will then not only report based on that data, but also invest based on that data. And because they invest based on that data, the real economy will change. And all of a sudden, um, you know, we are a more f climate friendly economy. And there are a lot of shortcuts in there that I think need to be proven. You know, if I'm as an investor only forced or, or being asked to report, that doesn't necessarily mean that I reallocate my investments. Once I reallocate my investments and I buy and sell shares, I'm not impacting the real economy. You mentioned cost of, cost of capital might go up, um, Lucrecia. If enough investors do that, that might happen. But frankly, most investors sell their shares because somebody else is buying their shares from them, right? So you're decarbonizing your portfolio. You have no exposure to the fossil economy, for example, anymore. But you have not decarbonized the real economy. And to bring this back to the discussion, sometimes I'm, I'm almost concerned to hear what the regulator wants to achieve by saying, you know, if only we can measure this right, the world will decarbonize. That is maybe spending a lot of time on the question of how to measure it perfectly that still doesn't trigger the action that the regulator has in mind when he or she's t talking about why all these measures are being put into place. So, um, so this is just as an opener and then very happy to dive into some of, the, of these topics. Thanks a lot, Max. So this, this uh, raises some of the issues that I think are at the heart of the whole debate. So how does that, um, you know, if, if we see some information about that, how does that translate into actually, uh, you know, an, adopt an adaptation of behavior among the agents? And you're sort of, um, you know, watering it down a little bit by saying, okay, it's not that clear that particularly investors, and you're referring to institutional investors, asset managers here, will indeed uh, adapt their portfolio. On the other hand, uh, you see the impressive numbers that Lucrezia has put out there. There is this inflow into uh, you know, sustainable finance um, funds that sort of claim that they do invest in a specific manner. Um, but I would just like to open it up and uh, solicit some immediate comments from the panelists. So um, let me turn it over to Jeff again. Um, is there anything that, that you wanted to comment on? Um, and also, particularly, do you see um, from what you've heard on the panel a challenge to your very articulate view uh, that it's only climate that matters for investors? Um. Well, I, I, I'm not sure what matters for investors. Um, it's that what should policy make makers focus on? And um, the climate change issue, so far as I can see it, is um, so much more urgent than the other issues. Um, one and secondly the kind of disclosure that we could have is feasible in the climate change area uh the question about the impact the connection between that disclosure 
and the ultimate decarbonization of the economy, as Max puts it in a nice way. That's a question, but at least the variable that we would want to have disclosed is one that we could actually construct and focus on. However, challenging that's going to be if you go, you know, to scope three, et cetera. Sustainability disclosure, on the other hand, um, uh, I think is a morass. Um, and um, uh, particularly at a time when the effort to change the economy in a way that will um, reduce the carbon inputs, the carbon outputs, will have an impact on growth, uh, trying, on the other hand, to have a series of social goals pursued through sustainability disclosure and the rationing of credit that will be entailed, uh, that will also be a drag on growth. And um, I think uh, putting the two together is unwise. Um, a final point, um, coming back to the climate change disclosure versus other so sorts of ESG G disclosure. I mean, ESG disclosure, as is, is Max knows better than most, um, is, is uh, um, I mean, the indices, for example, or, you know, uh, on which a lot of uh, the screening is based are um, contested, to put it in the very least. So, so I guess my point, point is, and, you know, I'm sorry to have missed the whole event and get a better sense as to what the discussion's been, but focusing on the climate change disclosure, how do we do, do, do that well and right and get what we want out of that is so much, from my perspective, so, so much more urgent than I think, you know, the other piece of that I saw with the sustainability disclosure is um, an unwelcomed unwel addition to what I think is an already heavy agenda of economic trans tran transformation to deal with the climate change risk. All right. But if I understand that correctly, that's more a pragmatic argument saying, okay, we have limited resources and therefore we should focus. And I just wanted to, to solicit your view, uh, Almut, on that because you've been arguing for a holistic approach. I don't see necessarily an extreme tension between what Jeff is saying and what you've been saying, but maybe you can just respond a little bit to this idea that you should focus on climate, but Jeff doesn't say that climate is narrow, so that may be broader and mm. maybe there is some common ground here. I, th I think there is, and I think there's sort of, you know, with, to speak with Faust, probably two hearts in my breast at least, sort of thing, you know. Um, I'm all for pragmatism, and, and obviously we need, we need to move on, 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 you know, let's say on climate. We need to move on climate, I mean, because obviously, you know, we've waited for far too long. The, the, the potential, you know, warning is that we can move on climate and actually um, incentivize actions in various ways that could actually not, not help us with the climate issue, even though we are actually trying to do something that, you know, solves climate issues, but it actually will, you know, come back to us. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we can incentivize actions on climate change and really mess it up elsewhere. And I think that's something we hopefully agree on that we don't want, want to do. So maybe just put an, an, another elephant into the room. I think there was one in the room already this morning. I would like to put another Getting elephant cool. in the, in, into, into the room. And, and if I may, just add three brief examples for that. Um, right, okay, I'm going to put a big battery into my big SUV and then I can sort of, you know, keep selling and driving the SUVs, problem solved, fine. No, don't believe that. Um, coal energy, really bad, we all agree on that. Great, let's, you know, produce 200 exajoules of energy per year from, from bioenergy, green, renewable not a good idea. We probably need possibly, you know, the equivalent of two sizes of India to grow those bioenergy plants. Where is that? You know, we want to eat as well. Um, example number three, you know, renewable energies, let's say sort of, you know, wind, solar, really good. And I'm actually, <laughs> I really support that. On the other hand, you know, if we're starting to 
to mine the, the deep sea ocean floor for cobalt nodules, because we need them for all kinds of things, we're destroying an ecosystem that we haven't even been to. It's like destroying the Mars. We haven't been to. We have no idea what we're destroying. So how do we, how do we get out of this mess? And the elephant in the room is 8 billion, right? We're 8 billion now. Welcome. We're by far too many people on the planet, and many of us, not all, consume by far too much. That's not, not a very popular statement in an economy that is based on consumption, I realize that, but maybe we should also reflect a little bit on those challenges. All right, uh, yes, um, so, so, so um, you already know, noticed there's a loss in biodiversity here because we only have elephants, right? So this is uh, <laughs> one thing that to observe, but another aspect. Um, They're threatened in yeah, some places. Yeah, I know, <laughs> it's good that we just populate here. So, uh, <laughs> Lucrezia, uh, you can react to, to what you heard, but in particular, I would be interested in, uh, you've mentioned uncertainty as one of the challenges that we're facing, and maybe you can relate that to the challenge that the standard set in particular is facing. Um, so what, what, what is it, what, how should they react to some of the uncertainties? Because Arnold has been pointing out some of the interdependencies that we know, the Latin effects that we know about, but of course the unknown unknown is the interesting um, aspect. And yeah, but I'll, I'll let me just f sure. say something, uh, you know, as a, I mean, the accountant are not going to change the world, okay? So we are talking about accounting standards. <laughs> so I'm a very radical person in terms of climate change and everything else, but, uh, you know, we are talking about accounting standards, okay? So this is just a tiny tool which, uh, you know, has to be part of the conversation. And, uh, but we have to be careful because if we charge accounting standards with too much demand, those accounting standards will lose credibility and there will be an enormous backlash. So on that one, I am much more conservative because although I think that there should be, you know, a carbon tax and that, uh, you know, all kinds of other things and public investment uh, and so on and so forth and decreasing consumption and that uh, Greta versus, uh, uh, versus mask, maybe Greta has a point that also we need to change the way we live. As, a for, as an accounting standards, uh, you know, I am much more conservative because, uh, you know, we have to, we are talking to investors. Investors may actually, you know, change preferences and so on, but the easier way to understand how investors behave uh, is the fact that they look at risk uh, and returns, okay? And on that perspective, uh, we know that climate uh, is a systemic risk. We know that biodiversity is a systemic risk. I have some sympathy, actually, although the IFRS has said, uh, the ISSB has said climate first, but not climate only. But we have been conservative exactly for the concern that Jeff uh, expressed. Let's start with climate and let's see how it goes, okay? Because already when we say, uh, you know, scope one, scope two, scope three, where are the data for scope three? You heard it earlier on today. So, and we don't have the infrastructure. So I think for this discussion, I think it's very important. Uh, I actually disagree with you because, uh, I mean, the data business, uh, it's, uh, it has flourished as a consequence of this demand from investors and so on. But actually, the data are not comparable. The data are, of course, message, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, different data providers do different things. For a regulator, for a standard setter, this is a problem. So I think that data should be a public good, actually. And then, uh, you know, you guys, you know, you can do other things, but, uh, you know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe become an <laughs> academic. <laughs> you know, you just find another job, okay? So <laughs> but, you know, you cannot that's have... Uh, I transition. mean, you cannot do policy if you don't know what the data says. And already on climate, we have uh, uncertainty. And so here I come on uncertainty. Uh, also, you know, as a macroeconomist, which is really my day job, uh, uh, you know, and and, you know, having looked at how scenarios uh, are conducted in monetary policy and for monetary policy and so on, including for, for climate, we are actually confronting with, uh, you know, with the type of risk, uh, which is very difficult to attribute probability to, to these uh, 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 extreme events. Uh, this is a, you know, it's a well-known problem, uh, but uh, which is a very bad problem for modelers. And so we advocate st uh, stress tests. So that's an important tool. 
but stress tests have to be used wisely, okay? So like, uh, you know, you, it's easy to do a stress test where you have all kinds of possible outcomes, then what do you do with it? Okay, so that, that's a real question. So, uh, yeah, definitely, thanks. Uh, so, so Max, you've been uh, addressed directly, so you're facing your idiosyncratic transition risk. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, but beyond that, maybe you want to comment on some of the, the aspects that have been touched upon from your point of view? Yeah, lots of, um, lots of food for thought. Maybe um, uh, I start with Jeff and his um, statement to say, let's focus on climate and then on greenhouse gas emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions, I can speak on behalf of our clients, will not do the trick for them to understand where a company is going. Why? Because greenhouse gas emissions are last year's emissions, right? So the, the year has to be concluded for a company to report what they emitted regardless whether scope one, scope two, scope three. And um, then it takes a few months until it is being reported. And then, uh, you know, with that time lag, it is in the hands of investors. So if you say greenhouse gas emissions helps investors, then it is not helpful for investment decisions. Why? Because I would invest in a low carbon company based on the greenhouse gas uh, data that I have, not realizing that this company is about to increase its its carbon footprint. Or conversely, I say I will not <coughs> invest in this company because it, has this, it had this enormous carbon footprint last year and I kick it out of my portfolio not realizing that this company is transitioning. So um, our clients need this qualitative information that tells them whether a, whether a company has a climate strategy in place, whether it's in track to, on track to achieve this climate strategy, um, whether the strategy or target is actually ambitious enough and so on. So, um, so Jeff, I would say, you know, um, greenhouse gas, I, 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 I must say I'm guilty of, this is the company that I started 12 years ago, co-inventing investment carbon footprinting. Um, so I've, I've, I've dealt with that for a long time. Carbon footprinting of investment portfolios, which is in essence what investors would do with greenhouse ga gas data that companies report, is a great way to you know, if you're ill to take temperature, so to see whether your temperature is going down, whether your greenhouse gas emissions are going down. But it is not a way to get your greenhouse gas emissions down. For that, you need to understand what aspirin to take. And that is this qualitative information that investors need as well. And then in hindsight, as you said, Jeff, you know, you look at five years trailing greenhouse gas emissions and you can say, it brought down my greenhouse gas emissions of my portfolio by investing in companies that had decarbonization pathways. So that's, that's um, one aspect. And then obviously, look, I have to, I have to, you know, I have four children. I, I have to keep this job for a little longer. <laughs> you can help, <laughs> you know, you can do other things. No, you, but, can, uh, um, you can do modeling, yeah. but no, not but I, data prediction. But, but this, is, this is maybe, this is a myth that, I, that, I, that I'm very happy to bust um, on, on this stage. So what is happening a lot in academia these days is that um, researchers procure ratings, ESG ratings from us, from our competitors. They put them next to each other. They say, we look at this company, you know, and through the lenses of ISIS ESG, this company is an A, and through the lenses of another ESG rating provider, it's a C. So obviously these ESG rating providers are rolling the dice. It's intransparent and, and it needs a standard setter who tells these guys how to measure sustainability. And that is as if you stand on the highway, uh, on a bridge over the German Autobahn, you look down, you see 20 different cars, a truck, a, a, a race car, and you say, these cannot be cars because they look different. It's important to keep in mind that ESG ratings are unlike credit ratings, not just answering one question. Can the company pay me back, yes or no? They answer hundreds of questions, and these questions are rolled up, and it depends what question you ask. So if you look at under the hood of an ESG data and service provider like us, we have six different ratings alone, a corporate rating, which is what is being looked at, but also a rating that looks at SDGs, a rating that looks at climate alone, mm -hmm. a rating that looks at transparency, impact, risk. Can These are different it? aspects. And I think, it's, I think it's good, uh, I think it's dangerous to say, we tell you how to measure sustainability, not because my job is on the line, but because that is not what investors want. Sophisticated investors who are using ESG data for the last decades are actually asking for these different approaches to understand it. And it is very often from a, from a part of the market that is relatively new to this and says, Darn, now this, you know, this ESG data is coming down the line, who, who ask for simple answers in a world where even the question is already complicated. And from a regulatory point of view, it's also sometimes 
failing the goal to make investors ESG literate, which is one of the things that, uh, that um, regulators want to achieve, if the answer is to tick the box. But that's, you know, um, that is an immediate reaction to, to, to yours, and I'm very happy to co-publish yeah, a but paper. I mean, I think no, let me just, let no, me but just I just want to clarify one thing, because, because otherwise the discussion goes all over the place. So, uh, I mean, the rating, you use weighting, uh, and you can do you, the weighting that uh, yeah. your clients want, or you want, or whatever. But the data is, is a different thing. So what the I'm advocating okay. is that uh, if you have standards uh, that the data that you use uh, to uh, then uh, produce the standards, those data that are behind, and this mm -hmm. is a point that was made this point by somebody, I don't remember who, have to be available for you know, everybody to, you okay, know. So, so first, let me let, just, no, now let me I just, need to react to this to get no, how many because, seconds because on the, on the stage. Know, no, 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 I'm just I'm watching TV and that's boring for them, so we you are, have we a are final word. That's good. good. So and not, you can no, keep no, your no, job, no, you can keep your job. Let me just give the audience the opportunity to ask them questions, and I will bundle them together and then give our panelists the chance to respond and have a final word, and then we can go for lunch. Yes, please. Um, I want to pick up a point that Lucretia made, but I think others have implicitly made. Um, I think she is right when she says, I want to be modest in what I am trying to do, because this is not necessarily, we can't give all of social policy or all of economic policy to something called an accounting standards board, which is a very um, impersonal and in many ways a highly undemocratic um, being. Um, and in the same way, we've had exactly the same problem with central banks that we handed macroeconomic management over the last 10, 15 years to central banks because governments actually refused to do the jobs themselves. Then we found that we were actually handing environmental policy to central banks because they were also trying to set up their criteria um, for assessment. And again, the same complaint is about, you know, who are these bodies? who are taking responsibility and where does the public stand. Um, but we did have the counter side to this point, which is that many people suggested, well, actually the public either don't know and don't understand, or actually the public, when it comes down to it, have got far more pressing and immediate concerns which they are worried about. And I come back to my comment about um, Larry Fink and what um, BlackRock said only uh, a, a few weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so this is a little bit like, like Groundhog Day because the interventions from the audience are exactly the same. You and now Thomas Hickler. And then we expect Loriana to say something. No, just <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 that's fine. Oh, sorry, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, many scientists, um, including myself, have spent years to show how too much focus on climate change only has killed biodiversity, has polluted our waters, and has increased world hunger. The IPCC and IPBES have written a common report because of the strong trade-offs and synergies between action on climate change and biodiversity. So if all this, and yeah, Almud, you already illustrated the, you know, the, the problem with bioenergy. Um, if, if all this is ignored in accounting standards, then maybe we miss a big chance and accounting standards do not contribute to a better planet as much as they could if these interlinkages are actually taken on board. Um, yeah. All right, so we have one last intervention from the audience and then <laughs> can do it in stereo, if you will. So. Probably better not two microphones. Gunter Lenk, University of Mannheim. Um, we've talked about the two perspectives. What's the impact of a business on the world and what's the impact of the world on the business? Is there any evidence to what extent these two perspectives actually overlap? <laughs> Simple question, maybe. All right, yeah. very good, very brief, very simple. So um, take that as an example, how to re respond now and have some final words. But I think uh, particularly the, the intervention of Thomas Hickler was addressed to you, Jeff. Um, so maybe you want to respond and just have a final word on your side. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, so the idea of, um, of impact and risk. Um, you know, impact is very difficult to figure out. Um, uh, so 
so the the activists, for example, <clears throat> who have um, successfully pressed Shell to become a green energy company have succeeded in uh, inducing Shell to offload its brown assets into the hands of those who whose whose actions are less visible and who probably will manage those assets in a, a less climate front friendly way than Shell might might have if uh, the assets were owned by Shell. Um, so so um, the interaction effects here, I think, are complex. Um, the advantage of disclosure is that it, it, it will be reflected in price. And actually, I think, uh, and, and the price will bear on systematic risk elements. And so will be a, potentially a meaningful change to price. Different firms will be exposed to systematic risk in different ways. And so I, I, in focusing on the greenhouse gas variable, I don't mean to limit it to just the number of uh, the level of CO2 emissions. I think the transition path away from carbon is, is consistent with the idea of focusing on a single thing, which is kind of the heart of my claim uh, that we ought to find a single variable that's really important uh, the climate change variables and devote our energy to that uh, because of the urgency of it. And I see, you know, uh, the diffusion of energy into the sustainability directive, uh, the sustainability release that I saw. And, and in a sense, that's kind of the, the, the uh, reaction I have, both that disclosure will affect behavior in powerful ways, I think, as it affects uh, the pricing of these assets over time. And secondly, we shouldn't expect of disclosure more, more than it can do, um, uh, which is an argument for, you know, a, a sort of a mono focus rather than uh, the effort to um, uh, have massive disclosure on variables that are very hard to, um, to get the data for, as well as to, um, uh, to trade off against one another. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm with your final reaction. Yeah, and maybe just commenting on, on, on Lucretia's comments, uh, the, the accountants are not going to save the world, and I'm actually very glad to hear that. I don't think <laughs> I want to live in a world <laughs> saved by accountants. <laughs> okay. um, and, but, but you're right, I mean, coming back to the pragmatism, and, and, and I mean, I do, I, accountants can, can, can play their role, and I think that is important, and I think sort of, you know, from a pragmatic perspective, starting with climate change is for sure not a bad idea and i guess that the only point that we're trying to make i guess sort of you know as natural scientists in the room you know there's a sense of urgency that pervades society on all levels including you know standards uh, that we really need to take action on climate change fine given we just should not fall into the trap of you know incentivizing actions that are going to mess up the planet elsewhere i think that is the whole thing and you know and i think the forward looking the future looking aspect um, you know, is an absolutely crucial one. I mean, backward looking is not going to help us a lot. We really need to have the, you know, the decadal future perspective in mind with whatever kind of, you know, action we're taking. And if accountants are going to help us with that, then I'm all in for it. Thanks, thanks, Amun. Uh, Lucrezia? Yeah, I mean, I, I will react to three questions. When one on, uh, on the two perspective, what is uh, the two materiality aspect of your questions? Uh, uh, so as uh, Sue explained this morning, uh, so the, the disclosure, uh, so it's very difficult to understand, uh, you know, what matters. But I mean, the, the perspective that the SSB uh, on climate has been actually to ask uh, uh, companies to disclose about what they do to the environment, scope one, scope two, and scope three, even if uh, our purpose, our main focus uh, is uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the, the investors and the risk for the investors. And this is because we believe uh, that the emitters are more risky and so that there is actually, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a double causality there. And so, and this is what we have called dynamic materiality. So that we are sort of in between. Uh, we are not prescriptive, however, on what companies should do and not should do, uh, like the taxonomy that the commission, for example, 
has uh, proposed, uh, and uh, you know there will be a discussion uh, later on about that. Okay, we're not prescriptive because actually we. We talk to the investors, we look at uh, sector specific, how the, how the investors, uh, how the companies adjust to this risk. Uh, but we believe that in the risk assessment, uh, the emissions themselves uh, are also important. Um, now, and, and on the empirical evidence, uh, I cited the evidence uh, that I'm aware of uh, that actually looks like uh, the emitter have, uh, uh, you know, or they have lower expected returns. Okay, so that. Uh, uh, so that there is, you know, so the, the brown, the brown company uh, trade at a, at a premium. Okay, so that's so that's the evidence. Now on uh, climate, f uh, on all these things about should we go beyond climate, the SSB will go beyond climate, but will start with a relatively conservative approach because I think because of the reason that. Uh, I try to advocate, I think, that we still have to know about data, uh, you know, assurance, uh, there is the issues of convergence, uh, you know, because um, if we do fantastic standards and then no nobody follow them, uh, you know, I don't think that this is going to be very useful, okay? But, you know, the aspiration, everything that is uh, systematic risk, and I totally get the point of the scientist, uh, it's important uh, in principle. So you should help in understanding with the data, uh, you know, how to make them, uh, you know, how to make this uh, you know, concrete uh, and tangible. And, uh, but, uh, okay, so on, on your point, uh, I mean, I think this is related. I mean, we should avoid to ask the accountant to do too much. Public policy has the main responsibility in here. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, these are complementary tools and, uh, you know, it would be really bad if we thought, well, now we have the standards, so, you know, forget about the carbon tax. Okay, that would be really bad. Okay. So that all right, so final word, Max. Yeah, um, many thanks. To react to the biodiversity um, um, call that you gave, you might be aware that in France, investors as of end of this year will be obliged to report on um, the biodiversity impact of their portfolios. Um, and that's part of the energy transition law, the same law that started um, in the run-up to, um, to, uh, to the COP conference in, in Paris. Um, <coughs> obliged investors to report on climate. So a lot of what we see happening in biodiversity actually rhymes with what we saw five years ago in climate. You have the TCFD in climate, you have the TNFD in biodiversity, right? You have a global regime um, in climate, uh, the Paris Agreement, you have a biodiversity agreement that, that Germany signed, you know? So there is um, a lot of this rhymes and we can feel that it is uh, arriving in the investor space and we are helping investors to, to get their arms around that. So, um, so hopefully, you know, this is happening at, at, the, at the speed necessary. Um, on the overlap between um, impact and risk, um, yeah, I, I agree um, with uh, Lucrezia here. The, the motivation in some aspects of how that plays out is almost, you know, um, doesn't matter. Very often, by the way, it's mixed anyways, right? It's impact and risk, and it's not that black and white. But if you think about other things that investors are doing, for example, engagement. So they sit down with company management based on data again, and they say, you know, we expect you to give yourself a climate strategy. They can do that because they say, you know, from a risk <coughs> perspective, otherwise it will impact my returns. Or from an impact perspective, I'm holding you as a company and I want you to be a force of good because you are part of my investment. Same making use of the vote at the annual general meeting. You know, you might vote against the management of a company um, because you feel that your view of the company's climate strategy is not reflected either from an impact perspective, you know, you feel the company is not doing what it should do to the world, or from a risk perspective, you say, I'm invested in that and these directors are not doing what they should do to make sure that I get my returns. So, um, so it's a bit of both. And uh, Lucrezia, I would like to, like to finish on, on, you know, an harmonic, um, I'm in yeah, agreement with you, friend. raw data, <laughs> raw data from, um, from companies um, should be consistent and um, and digestible um, and by the way that doesn't put our business model into jeopardy so I will still have a job so it's no, all no, I happy believe so. no, I, so I believe so. Great, that's a great <laughs> closing remark so we have to wholeheartedly thank our panelists and also the audience for their very thoughtful interventions and let's uh, join join me uh, just in a big applause and then we have lunch thank you so much.